All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's eat and greet. I feel like we haven't had an eat and greet in a really long time, but I think it's only been like four days, but that's a really long time around here. You know, it feels like there's an eat and greet like every five minutes happening. But today we are welcoming back Glenn Mitchell to the Cyber House. We tried to eat and greet before and the technology gods were not in our favor. So we're back we're going to go through aspect patterns today to show you some examples. And if this is something you've had questions about, Glenn even has a beautiful book that is out there written, makes it simple so you can understand what these mean, how to work with them and all that good stuff. So welcome and welcome back, Glenn, all at the welcome. same time. Thank you. Yeah. It. Pleasure to have you. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. I know, especially since now we're like live on the internet. Last time it just was <laughs> not happening. Yeah. Well, yeah. those things happen. And congratulations. You just finished two years of study at the Avalon School. That's a big deal. Congrats. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Just you. just for clarity for um, maybe for some of the, the viewers, listeners, what made you what made you choose to go through Avalon? Because I know people are considering it. Um, I had a great deal of respect for um, and friendship with David Cochran. Um, and wanted David Cochran as a mentor. And there you go. You're like, I'm going to attach myself to you for two years. Two and a half. <laughs> two and a half. Let's do not do not leave off that half, right? That's right. That's right. Well, congratulations, and I look forward to you know hearing more about that and kind of engaging you, you on that. So, if anybody is thinking about uh, the Avalon School or it's been in your 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 thought box or something like that. Glenn is also a good resource for understanding what the curriculum looks like there and kind mm -hmm. of what what the expectation is. So and Glenn will make sure all your contact information is underneath this video. So I'm sure people okay. will reach out and want to know things. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, brilliant. Now you have written us a book. I've written a book. <laughs> You've written a book. And you made these aspect patterns easy to understand. Can you tell us about that? I tried hard. Um, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't claim to be the first to write about them. Um, chart patterns were written about by Mark Edmund Jones um, decades ago. Uh, aspect patterns, which are a little different, and we'll talk about both, were written by Bill Turney. Um, Robert Jansky wrote about both of them. And I read a quote a long time ago from somebody. It might have been on the, it might have been on Facebook. Um, but I read a quote by somebody that said that they wished that Mark Edmund Jones had been translated into English. <laughs> because he's kind of a difficult read, um, kind of dry, um, kind of boring. And I found him that way too when I read him. And so I decided to, right then and there, when I read it, I decided to try to synthesize and popularize what he wrote. That's yeah. one of the skills that I have is to be able to synthesize and simplify. Yeah. At least I think that's one of my skills. So I tried to write it in simpler language for folks, more everyday language for folks. So. That's, that's brilliant because there's a lot of information out there and you can start heading in a lot of different directions. Um, yeah. In, information wise and kind of be spinning in no time, you know, but I guess one of the questions I have is just um, overall in, in a chart, are the patterns significant or are they just something that it's like, oh yeah, this does make this pattern, but it's less significant than, than doing a reading of the rest of the chart or does it play into the fold of all of it? For me, it plays into the, into the full reading of the chart. Uh, I, the reason I read the, the another reason that I wrote the book, my first mentor, Noel Till, used to talk about the bigger bells in the chart. And he used to argue that you should spend no more than 15 to 20 minutes preparing for a chart. Now, when I first started 40 years ago reading charts, I would spend hours preparing for a consultation because there's just I wanted to understand every little nuance that there is in a chart. And one of the things that Noel Till taught me was that there's just simply no time for all of that information in a 60 to 90 minute consultation. Clients are not going to pay you hundreds of dollars to spend days with them um, going over the information in a chart or hours to go over the information in a chart. 
And so you have to learn, if you're going to be an efficient astrologer, you have to learn what really matters, what really resonates quickly with the client and what it would be nice to know if there was more time. And so you focus on um, getting to the heart of the chart. And that's what I tried to do was to focus on those elements that you could in 15 or 20 minutes, taking a look at the chart, be able to do a uh, astrological reading for someone. So somebody who picks up the book can get a reading of their own chart relatively quickly, just working through the chapters in the book. Brilliant. And is there, is there one aspect pattern that is like the most common? Oh yeah, there are, there are um, aspect patterns that are very common. Uh, there are aspect patterns that are relatively rare. Um, the bucket, for example, is I believe the most common. It's very, very common. Um, so um, in the book, I enumerate the actual percentages for the various aspect patterns and chart patterns. I uh, calculated them using solar fire from right. the Astro Data Bank data. So um, that's not everybody in the world, that's notables, but um, among notable people, um, there are thousands, as you know, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of cases in the Astro Data Bank. So I loaded all of that up into solar fire and solar fire enabled me to count out how many people have different kinds of chart patterns and aspect patterns. Brilliant. And is, is Solar Fire your go-to software? It has been for a number of years. I use I, I float between Solar Fire and Sirius um, from Cosmic Patterns, David Cochran's software. So it just depends on my mood and what I want to look at. I also use for, for astro astrocartography. I use Matrix's program for astrocartography, uh, Horizons. So, you know, I have just about every piece of software on the market um, and have used them all at one time or another. But Solar Fire has been my favorite for a number of years. I like the way the wheels look in Solar Fire. Um, I'm not as um, the wheels in, in serious. Sirius provides more information about the chart in, in many ways. Uh, so if I want a, a fuller set of information, I would go to Sirius, but the wheels aren't as, as sexy for me as they are. In sure. Fire. I know, and even today it was interesting. You were showing me how to reset a wheel that I have and it's like a whole new world. I'm like, what is going on over here? You know, yeah. but it's interesting what you kind of are drawn to look at even in, in, in wheel style, something as simple as that. So it's kind right. of interesting. Right. Yeah. You got to get used to where things, where things are located in, in Sirius. Um, Sirius is not as intuitive to navigate as Solar Fire is. Solar Fire is easier to customize. Mm -hmm. um, so Sirius has its strengths. It has many strengths. Um, all the programs do. They have their relative advantages. And one of the relative advantages of Solar Fire is that it's very easy to customize. Sure. Well, and I am like a newbie to Solar Fire. Okay. <laughs> so I keep finding myself in this dance on at any given moment while I'm learning Solar Fire going, mm -hmm. oh, forget it. And I put it down and I go back over to Sirius because I've been working with that for what, six years. So okay. as I'm like learning Solar Fire, but I do love that in Solar Fire, as soon as you open it up, it's like, here's the transits of the day. Like, it's almost like a happy welcome message, right. I feel like. <laughs> right which is kind of, kind of neat. Mm -hmm. So, all right, well, let's get in it. Let's take a look at some charts, but let's also talk about, let's, let's talk about this. What, are, what is the big thing that we need to know going into everything we're going to look at today about well, these chart patterns? The, there are a number of features that I look at in the chart that are really, really obvious that I can look at in a glance and gain a lot of insight and begin a conversation with the client. And sometimes, often, I'm, often my hunches are correct. Uh, what I read in the chart resonates with the client. Sometimes 
the hunches are wrong. Sometimes the, the what I read in the chart doesn't resonate with the client and that's okay. We still wind up having an interesting conversation because I don't do readings, I do consultations, I have discussions. My style is interrogatory, I ask lots of questions. So during a consultation, I listen more than I talk, which is unusual for me. Normally I talk more than I listen. Um, <laughs> Story of my during, life, Glenn. <laughs> but not during a consultation. Um, <laughs> so I'm very careful to, to listen a great deal and ask a lot of questions, put people on the spot. Um, but so the things that I pay attention to that are real obvious for me to see just at a glance, for example, is how the planets line up in the hemispheres of the chart, you know, north, south, east, west, um, and in the quadrants. So that's something that you can tell at a glance. And once you understand the meaning of the hemispheres, you know at a glance what questions to ask somebody uh, to, to begin a discussion. Also, the, the chart patterns, the, the, the Mark Edmund Wilson chart, uh, Mark, Mark, uh, Mark, not Mark Edmund Wilson. <laughs> we just give him a new name. That's fine. Mark Edmund Jones chart patterns, um, you know, the bucket, um, the the um, the splash the, the locomotive those sorts of things um, they're also very obvious and right there on the chart you can't miss them so again you can look at the chart within a minute or two and you can see those things and they tend to resonate with clients very well and so again you can begin a discussion the aspect patterns take a little more um practice to recognize right away but once you get that practice you can recognize t-squares and grand trines and yods and things like that in a chart and again with that experience practice reading those things you again know right away what questions to begin to to ask the client or if you're trying to read your own chart you know where to flip to in the book in order to make sense out of those features in your chart. Awesome. Other things like the highest planet in the chart and things like that are pretty easy to read too. So um, I take it in pieces. Um, and so I always start off with the hemisphere analysis and then I proceed to the Mark Edmund Jones uh, chart patterns and then to the Bill Turney aspect patterns. Robert Jansky talked about both of those topics too. Um, so I've synthesized, my comments in the book are a synthesis of those things. When it comes to hemispheres, Noel Till had a unique interpretation to the hemispheres and I present both in the book, both the classic and both Mark Edmund Jones's interpretations of the hemispheres and Noel Till's interpretations of the hemispheres. I tend to prefer Noel Till's interpretation. Uh, but that's, how I, that's how I work my way through the chart. Some people work their way through the chart by starting off with where is, where is the sun, where is Mercury, where is Venus, in what house, in what sign. That's another way of, of you know, I call it ring around the rosy. Um, that's another way of approaching a chart. It takes a little longer to um, get your way through the chart and things are not as integrated as they are taking the approach that I prefer. So that's the benefit of focusing in on chart patterns and aspect patterns is that you're synthesizing more than one planet. You're, sure. you're synthesizing information from multiple planets. And it's kind of nice because it's like, just use your eyeballs. Like what can right. you see? Right? right. So that's what right. I love about the hemispheric analysis as well. It's like, well, what do you see? What's the very first impression you got of what you see? So that right. is such a beautiful, practical way to engage very somatically, even with the chart that's right in front of you. And then, oh, you see that big old square. Oh, you see that long triangle. What do you see? Mm -hmm. And that's going to start to tell a really big story immediately. Right. That's exactly it. Yay. That's exactly it. You can you can gain a lot of information in just a few minutes. Noel Till used to be able to sit down and he, he David Cochran has a great skill with cold readings as well. But I've never seen anybody like Noel Till when it comes to being able to do a cold reading. Um, he could take an instant look at a chart 
and see all the influences of Mars in a chart. I remember when he first saw my chart, Noel's approach was, um, my, look at that Mars. He had this deep baritone voice. He was an opera singer. He was almost seven foot tall. Um, oh and no, oh yeah, he was a very tall man, six foot 10, I believe, um, to be precise. Um, he, he, that was his first comment was to remark about all the influences of Mars in my chart. And he could tell it at a glance. So he didn't just focus on where Mars was and what planet and what house Mars was in, but he could see that Mars was on the Aries point and he could see, you know, rulerships and things like that. And so, um, he, he needed virtually no preparation time mm -hmm. in order to do a chart. He could do it cold. David Cochran can too. That's so brilliant. So I'm so excited. I'm so excited to get his method down and really see see how it works. Yeah, now that it seems you're like I was the traveling method. in that direction anyway. So mm -hmm. it's just a so chance that you've never had the opportunity to. I don't believe you've ever had the opportunity to speak with Noel. No, I haven't. And you know, I think it was a really interesting experience um, this year because without knowing it, I think I was naturally on the course to coming to this lineage, even though I don't mm -hmm. think I was fully aware of it, but just in the style that um, I was developing on my own on how to approach a chart. Mm -hmm. Then I found Elizabeth Grace and she's like, oh, that's how Noel teaches it look at this. But so when he passed, it was interesting that I had never met the man at that point. I had not picked up a book of his yet or anything like mm -hmm. that. And in his passing, I just had a sense of grief, you know, and I was like, well, I don't know this person. And I think sometimes um, in the lineage or, or even in the industry, when something like that happens, you don't have to be connected to him personally mm -hmm. to feel that. And so I just thought that was really interesting in my journey personally with with the till line this year that I was like, I didn't know him, but I feel like, oh man, I missed him. I missed him. What? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So ugh. Well, we I'm all sat on the shoulder of greats. Yeah. And I'm glad that there are, you know, people here, they're reaching out, they're teaching, you know, they're talking mm -hmm. about and teaching how he did and Kathy Rose and, and Matthew mm -hmm. and you and Basil and people are just phenomenal. So it gets to continue to live on, which is just a, a brilliant thing. Cause Man, I really was like, I missed him. <laughs> yeah, he was a brilliant man. Well, let's brilliant. take a look at some charts. Let's okay. see what we got. So I'm going to pull up the Eastern one, um, the one with the Eastern Hemisphere first. Or okay. do you want to okay. start with the Solaris? No, we can start with client charts if you like. That's fine. I have no problem with that. Oh, yeah. Let's do... Okay, I'm just going to pull it up and we'll <laughs> we'll get sorted. We'll figure ourselves here. Okay. okay. So um, here we can here we can see that there's an, there's um, planets that are clustered in houses 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, and 3. That's what we consider to be the Eastern Hemisphere. And we, we know from experience that those individuals, that pattern suggests individuals who are likely to be independent, strong-willed, um, and individualistic. They're typically highly motivated individuals. Often they're self-employed. They tend to be risk takers. Um, Noel Till's approach is that there tends to be a sense of protectionism about them within their, within their identity. So, in their case, life is conditioned by ego justification. There's a marked tendency towards defensiveness. And so when I do a consultation, as I told you, I tend to ask a lot of questions. I tend to listen more than talk. And so I would start off by asking a person whether or not they tend to feel defensive at times, whether that's a part of their, their psychological makeup. Noel was very psychological in his orientation. So that would be my, where I would first center my discussion with the client about in this chart. There is no particular quadrant that's, that's emphasized. We can break the hemispheres into halves and look at quadrants. Sometimes there are quadrants that are emphasized. And 
if I was to talk about a given quadrant with this client, it would be houses 10, 11, and 12. Um, but um, there's a lot going on in, in seven, eight, and nine. Um, so there's not really any quadrant that's particularly um, overemphasized. There's no quadrant that's empty. The chart pattern that this one tends to represent is what's called the low, what Mark Edmund Jones referred to as the locomotive. Mm. And that really is the most common chart pattern. So um, there's the presence of a grand trine in the pattern. Uh, it focuses the individual's energy just as the engine pulls the entire train, um, the leading planet in the locomotive pattern pulls the rest of the planets along with it. Um, and so um, the, the leading planet is the high focus planet um, in the pattern. It focuses on, it focuses the individual's energy uh, like I say, just as the, the, the engine pulls the train. Now, locomotive type individuals, they tend to be, uh, they tend to have a personality that's expected of an Aries type personality. Mm, so kind of fiery. Can, yeah, so they can be um, extremely driven individuals. Inertia is their defining characteristic. Once they're moving, they tend to stay moving. When they're at rest, they tend to stay at rest. Um, so uh, there's an initial, when they're at rest, there's an initial inertia that has to be overcome. But once they're set in motion, they're hard to stop. Sure. And so this momentum carries everything in their path along with them. Mm. Now, a grand trine lends them a uh, feeling of self-adequacy. They know they're going, they've got what it takes to solve a problem. So fact is though, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So, it, and it's almost impossible to persuade them otherwise, mm -hmm. since once they've decided to act. So they can be very uncompromising in that respect. Sure. Now, locomotive individuals also tend to be very predictable. Uh, they have their own peculiar way of approaching a problem. But after you get to know them as an individual, you can predict how they will react to a given set of circumstances. So that makes them, um, you know what to expect. There are no, there are no as any aspect patterns in this chart um, that, that are a particular note. So this chart was among, I've been doing chart readings now almost 40 years. This chart is among the, the set of charts that is generally unremarkable. There's not a lot to set this chart off um, as, as having prominent features. Um, and so there's, there is no tyranny aspect pattern for us to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, the most elevated planet is the moon um, and when the moon is the most elevated planet individuals feel compelled would be a good word for it to project their personality uh, or their emotions in public sure so with the moon positioned here individuals can feel the urge to expose their deepest and most vulnerable emotions in public Yeah. And when we're looking at just, mm -hmm. just for clarity, 
that oh. locomotive pattern is really that there's all of these guys over here. That's right. It's just like, so if you've got a chart where you're looking and you, it's, you've just got kind of the conglomerate of planets happening like that. And it almost is like, it looks like you leave one section open. That's right. Is what you, leave a section of about, you leave a section of about 90 degrees open. Mm -hmm. This, this section, well, you can't, you can't see my mouse moving, so I shouldn't. I, <laughs> I do that all the time. <laughs> Right, but there's, but there's but there's not a lot going on in yeah. You know, there's not a lot going on in how six, seven, even five, four, right. Um, right. five has Chiron in it. There's there's not a lot going on in that section of the chart. Um, that's why it's called a locomotive. And when we're looking at just for for clarity, when we're looking at aspect patterns, do mm -hmm. we stick to the planets or do points get to be in here as well? I'm sorry. Uh, oh, the points. There's some there's some disagreement on that as to whether or not we include points as well as as planets. Um, there generally we focus um, on planets rather than on um, the the midheaven, the ascendant, the descendant, the IC. Um, some astrologers will. Um, some astrologers won't. So the um, I have a tendency, depending on the aspect pattern, um, whether or not I look at points. So with a T-square, for example, um, I will have more of a tendency to look at points if okay. the T-square involves the ascendant or the midheaven. Um, I find that to be significant, for example. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, good that's question. always good to know because it's like, you know, I mean, depending on what you're doing, you can pull in the points, the part of fortune, the asteroids show up sometimes. So it's like, well, just right. for a clean picture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I'm a big fan of asteroids um, and not just the major five asteroids that people look at. Um, I, I've studied Martha Lang, Martha Lang Westcott's approach to asteroids, which looks at dozens and dozens and dozens of asteroids. And nobody's willing to pay for me to, again, spend hundreds of dollars in order to analyze 70 some different asteroids for them. Um, so in my own chart, I have looked at those asteroids. Um, sure. But, you know, you know, for clients, generally not. Um, so I tend to focus um, the, the, the planets and the major points. Um, I don't look at the part of fortune. Um, I do look at the, the so-called nodal access because the nodes are always 180 degrees apart. Um, mm -hmm. I do look at the nodal access because Noel Till focused on that a great deal, uh, particularly in relationship to um, the mother. Uh, yeah. But um, I find that there's enough to focus on between the planets and the points and the nodal access that I don't need to bring in other complicating factors. Okay. Uh, I'm not saying people shouldn't look at them or that those people who do are misguided. It's just, um, to me, it's added complexity. And again, I'm trying to be able to have, you know, I normally have a 90 minute consultation with somebody. And I spend about an hour to an hour and five, 10 minutes looking at the natal chart. And then I move on to the forecast. And so there's just not enough time in that process, I find, in order to work in the asteroids and the Arabic parts and, <clears throat> excuse me, other um, features of a natal chart. Sure, sure. Well, so, shall we take a look at another and see what we see? Sure, we can do that. Um, right. We've got your other um, chart that you sent me in advance. Okay, um, let's look at that one. Let's see. There we go. Okay. Yeah, Ooh. this chart you can see. Now, there's, there's some interesting things in this chart going on, but not in the hemispheric analysis. Right. <laughs> there, is, there is no um, hemisphere that's predominant in this chart. 
this chart, when we look at it, um, the pattern is what's called um, a seesaw. And you can see that by there's a focus of planets in houses four, five, six, and then we've got nine, 10, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and one. And so, um, so it's like, kind of like that. <laughs> yeah. And then on the other side, you've got, you've got four, five, and six. Yeah. Yeah. Weighing, weighing it out on the other side. So it's like a seesaw back and forth. Yeah. Really. Um, so the most telling part of a seesaw pattern generally is the nature of the oppositions. Um, there's a basic polarity so that the individual tends to swing from one general point of view to another point of view. Mm. So there must be at least one opposition present in order for there to be a seesaw pattern. Sure. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm. Um, so oppositions always indicate contrary forces are present. Um, so Robert Jansky recommends viewing the seesaw as one giant opposition. Um, the pulling the individual in two different directions. So they go through life trying to achieve a certain degree of harmony and balance. Mm. Now, one of the things that the typical seesaw individual is, is mutable. So uh, we all know about mutable signs and I'm not talking about it necessarily being in mutable signs, but the seesaw individual tends to be flexible, tends to be variable. So they have a ready, they have a ready capacity for adjustment okay. um, to the reality of the situation. They're able to reconcile opposing points of view, for example, and conflicting forces. So they naturally bridge differences. So oh, fixity good. on the fixity on the other hand. Um, frustrates, tends to frustrate seesaw individuals because they prefer fluid situations. Mm. Yep. So one word that would be good to use to describe them is versatility. Um, that's how, that's the type of life they'll tend to live. Uh, they should always balance themselves by coordinating their time and their talents. Now, there's a lot more that we could go into about seesaw patterns. I want to keep us moving along. We don't want to, we don't want to spend 15 minutes talking about seesaw, seesaw. patterns. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's the important takeaway and the kinds of questions it would lead me to ask an individual relate to how flexible they are in their point of view. Sure. Um, so, um, and, and how they react to change. Um, are they dynamic individuals? Are they flexible? Are they the kind of individuals who might, um, who are accepted of change? Some people resist change. Some people find change fearful. The um, seesaw individual would tend instead to, um, be more likely to relish change. Sure. And so that's the kind of questions that I would ask for that kind of individual. There is a grand trine in this chart in air. Um, it's between the moon, Mercury, and Pluto. Where'd my mouse go? Here we go. We've got moon here, Mercury here, Pluto down here. So shoop, shoop, shoop. Yeah. Oh, where's my little pencil? I can actually draw it. So maybe that makes it a little bit easier for you guys to see. Now, you know, just as I'm drawing a side note question though, uh -huh. um, in this particular chart to look at a yod configuration, will we use the descendant as a point? Do they get any points for that one here? Um, generally, we, generally I wouldn't use the descendant for a yod. Um, I, tried. I tried to get you some points. <laughs> <laughs> 
No points for the odd. Okay, grand try this, right there. But this chart does have a mystic rectangle. Mm -hmm. we'll talk about. So we'll talk about that too. Okay. Um, Grand trines, you know, which is three trines tied together, uh, making a big triangle like you did. Um, grand trines, particularly in air signs, tend to make the individual feel satisfied living in their head um, without the need to uh, express themselves in the external world. So they tend to be more introverted. They tend to be more into their into their into their mind. Um, both element and aspect um, here share a common denominator, and that is the ability to conceptualize and to think in abstract terms. So, the impractical side of this grand trine. Can be when the individual is unable to ground their idealistic insights. These tend to be very idealistic people, and sometimes they have a hard time dealing with the difference between their idealism, the way things ought to be as they perceive it, and the way things really are. And so that can cause some, some psychological tension for them. Um, and that again would be something that I would ask about their their idealism. I never conclude anything looking at a chart about an individual. Um, I always ask because things in a chart may or may not manifest at a given time for a given individual. The natal chart represents the whole life and we're talking, when I'm talking with an individual, we're talking at a given point in time. And so some things may have not yet come to pass. Some things may never come to pass in a chart. Um, context matters. A little girl growing up in Afghanistan um, has a very different life experience ahead of her than does a, a little girl growing up in the United States. Um, and one growing up in poverty has a different lifestyle expectation than one growing up in wealth. So um, any feature that we're talking about in a chart is potentially shared by many thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of individuals. And to say all individuals who have this feature have this particular attribute, um, I am not comfortable making that statement. Right. So that's why I always ask. I always have a dialogue with the client. Um, so um, I always talk in terms of, you know, with when I'm having like an interview with you, I will talk about what the chart suggests, what things seem, what I expect, what many people experience. But I stay away from making strictly deterministic statements that all individuals who have this feature have this particular personality trait. Because as soon as I say that, you'll be able to bring me all sorts of examples that have that chart feature and don't have that personality trait. And don't have that, yes. So, so it's like, don't uh, say it, just don't say it. So that's why we have conversations with individuals. That's why I don't sit here and say, you have this feature, therefore, you have this, you, you, you feel this way and you have this attitude, um, this has happened to you, I don't go there. Sure. Uh, my chart, my, my, my consultations are much more focused on psychology and trying to gain, help individuals gain insights. That's the great thing about astrology from my point of view is it gives us self-knowledge. We can learn more about ourselves through looking at our charts. And so, and that's what I try to help my clients do is I try to help them gain insight as to why they feel the things they feel, why they have the impulses that they have. I have a lot of Mars in my chart and in my youth, it got me into a lot of trouble. It still can get me in trouble if I'm not careful. Um, 
I have these impulses. I have the impulse to be um, impatient. I have the impulse to be rash. Um, but I also know that that's an impulse. I don't have to act out on those, on those impulses. I can behave differently if I want to. So astrology gives me the insight as to why I feel the way that I do, but I don't have to act out on those feelings. I don't have to be impatient with people. I don't have to be confrontational with people. So I don't have to give Mars free reign. Right, right. Now she's got uh, a mystic rectangle. I have one of those and I like them. And, and, and I just wanna share this with you. We've got somebody in mm -hmm. the chat box down here who says they just ordered your book. So Wonderful. yay for that. Mm -hmm. Also, somebody else said, I love a good mystic rectangle. I'm like, who doesn't? <laughs> well, this, this mystic rectangle, you know, like all of them, is composed of two oppositional patterns, um, each connected with two trine aspects along the length of the, tri of, of, of the rectangle, and then two sextile aspects along the width. Um, the, the, the planets in this one here are uh, Mercury, Venus, Neptune, and Pluto. Oh, okay. So we've got Mercury, Mercury Venus, Venus, Neptune, and Pluto. Make up a oh, mystic rectangle. This is interesting too. I know there's no points, but if we put Chiron and the nodes in there, we'd have it too. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. And we've got this whole situation. Let's bring everybody on here. This looks terrible, you guys. It looks fine. It's, it's, we get the idea that it's a rectangle. And there's some things going on here. Yep. Okay. All right. <laughs> In my toddler scratch, I've gotten it done. This is the vision. Um, so um, most, most astrologers view the overall effect of a mystic rectangle as being beneficial. Um, I do too. So um, the well-managed um, um, mystic rectangle gives people a strength and a purpose beyond what, typically, what we typically associate with oppositions. Um, so um, generally the mystic rectangle is considered to be a mild aspect pattern. Mm. Um, it doesn't have a lot of discomfort or resistance associated with it. Individuals do tend to feel the effects of the four planets in the mystic rectangle. So they will tend to, feel, this individual will tend to feel the, the effects of Mercury and Venus and Neptune and Pluto um, and a sense of working together, of being well balanced, uh, being integrated. So, yeah. mm -hmm. um, if the inner if the inner oppositions of the mystic rectangle, which you made with the the X's there, um, if those um, can be handled well, then the mystic rectangle can give the individual some inner harmony. So yeah. uh, it's a very interesting um, chart pattern and one that's not all that common. Mm -hmm. Not chart pattern, it's an aspect pattern. It's not all that common. It's relatively rare. I mean, grand trines and T-squares are very common. Sure. Uh, mystic rectangles are relatively uncommon. I don't remember the exact percentages off the top of my head. Again, they're in the book. Um, but it's a relatively much less common aspect pattern. There is an unaspected pattern or planet, planet in this um, chart and unaspected planets, um, as Noel Till described them, they tend to run away with the chart. Yeah. He called them peregrine planets. Um, I don't like to use the word peregrine because it has other meanings in astrology. It's one of those words that has multiple meanings. So I call them unasked. So I refer to them as do most astrologers as unaspected planets, but they're very important to look for. And the easiest way to find an unaspected planet is to look on an aspect grid. 
and then see which planet had makes no aspects to any of the other planets. And in this case, it's the sun. The, the sun is, is hanging out there all by itself. It's not aspected in a trine or a square or opposition or conjunction or anything like that with any other planets. So one line of thought about the unaspected planet is that the client will have difficulty expressing some of the characteristics of that planet. So one interpretation um, in this case would be that the individual would have difficulty expressing the sun, the, the sense of identity and self. Um, it sits in the chart without any major connection to other planets. And then, like I said, the other one is the interpretation that was favored by Noel Till uh, and myself. And that seems to be the preferred one these days. And that is that the unaspected planet is a powerful force uh, as it screams for attention because it doesn't make any aspects to other planets. So it's sitting there saying, hey, pay attention to me. Um, and so it tends to manifest um, in people's lives. Yeah, because it kind of has free reign. It's like, well, I am mm -hmm. untempered. I do what I want. So here exactly we go. Right. Exactly right. Exactly. That's exactly that's a good way to describe it. All right. the Taurus, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so brilliant. Um, Anything else in this one? Um, yeah, there are. If, as you'll notice, and this is something that you can tell right off the bat real easy too, when you look at the chart, there are a bunch of retrograde planets. Mm -hmm. um, you'll notice that Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto are all three retrograde in this chart. Right there, right there, yeah. guys. Yep, houses four, five, and six. Um, all three of those planets are retrograde. So retrograde Uranus creates difficulties in being uh, aware of and expressing inner individuality mm. because it's the planet of freedom and rebellion. But, so when we turn it inwards, it gives a need to rebel against ourselves. Yeah. This is that placement, if you have this, where it's like people say, oh, I survived all of these things this year. And your response is, I survived me. And I think that's <laughs> a real big deal, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Individuals with a, with a retrograde Uranus um, can um, have extreme individualism um, and even engage in self-destructive behaviors. So... Um, it's something to closely monitor oneself with um, when you have a retrograde Uranus. Especially there in the fifth house of pleasure, right? Yeah. Interesting yeah. relationship with pleasure. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. They tend to push things to extremes. So, um, yeah. The positive side of it is that you, Uranus retrograde individuals tend to be original. They feel a, they tend to feel a need to explore the new. Um, they feel, they tend to feel, um, they're likely to feel a need to share their ideas with others. Mm. So as in all planetary features, I don't think of them as good or bad. They all have their, their beneficial aspects. Uh, they can manifest themselves positively in our behavior and our attitudes, or they can be challenging um, and create difficulties for us um, in relating to others and um, being comfortable with ourselves. So I don't look at retrograde Uranus as being a negative feature in the chart they're all neutral. It all depends on how they manifest in your life. Right. And so um, retrograde Neptune gives 
generally generally give um, the desire to unveil mysteries and to expose religious shams. So mm -hmm. they're they're individuals who don't like religious con artists, for example. Sure. Um, when Neptune is retrograde, the individual um, finds it a challenge often to use available knowledge to uncover life's mysteries. They tend to be more, um, they tend to focus a lot on dreams and illusions and metaphors. Um, so uh, they're more inclined to, again, be introspective, to be introverted, um, to retreat into themselves. It's Another true. trait that often goes along with retrograde Neptune is um, a more suspicious nature. Um, they even often doubt themselves. So, yeah, doubt the knowledge, maybe even in Sagittarius, mm -hmm. huh? Yeah. Yeah. Retrograde Pluto. Um, they, retrograde Pluto is another one that individuals tend to find more challenging. Um, there's another chart pattern that individuals are measured that individuals tend to find more challenging um, because of inner conflicts. Um, outside forces have a tendency to upset their lives. Um, Pluto is, oh, well, actually, all three of these are interpersonal generational planets, um, but Pluto especially so. So um, as a consequence, most people are not fully aware of the effect that Pluto can have on their life. And so uh, when it's driven inward by retrograde motion, and that's what retrograde motion does. It drives the, the impact of the planet inwards. Pluto's quality of destruction and regeneration can lead to some real spiritual progress. That's on the, on the positive side. Mm -hmm. so, and I, I tend to find with, the, with that generation, you don't really have to force them into the spiritual work. They kind of in right. my experience of them, they kind of welcome it. They're like, well, all right. Right, I'll exactly. Reborn, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, power plays, Pluto people generally um, have, a, have a concern with, with power. Um, you know, it's, it's a planet associated with power plays, with people who play power games. Um, and I'm not saying all individuals with Pluto do that. I'm just saying it's associated with that. There's lots of individuals for whom that, that is a preoccupation. We find it in the charts of, of politicians and the like, you know, um, heavily aspected Pluto or very prominent place to Pluto. Um, the... Um, The, when it's in a good position in the chart, um, the retrograde Pluto um, can make the individual um, it can make the individual an outcast um, when it's not well aspected, sure. when it's more challenging. Um, so. Um, I have like all of those planets retrograde. <laughs> they're, they're, they're all three generational planets. So you share that with millions of people. And that's again, why I say tends to likely generally, um, you're not alone in having those planets retrograde. 
Um, a lot of people born around 1974 have all three of those planets retrograde. So um, people who sit and peer at ephemerides can, get, can become very good at knowing when a client from a client's birthday, they don't even have to right. see the chart to know that they're going to have certain planets retrograde because they have it all memorized in their head where the, where the, when the planets switch from being direct to retrograde, the outer planets. Yeah. Uh, I was talking with Matthew and we were actually laughing about um, how Kathy Rose just has an active memorized ephemeris in her head about mm -hmm. like everything. It's just it the most impressive thing ever. She's like, oh, and this and this. I'm like, do you have that thing just active in your mind? Did you memorize it? Mm -hmm. it's pretty impressive. She does. She, 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 she talks about it all the time, different generations <laughs> of individuals. <laughs> Brilliant. All right. Anything no, else in this chart? I get a slurp. No, we I'm... see Dustin. I want to know what okay. Dustin Hoffman's got going on. You want to know about Dustin Hoffman? Okay. Let's talk about Dustin Hoffman. He's got, he's got a very interesting chart. There's a lot going on in, in Dustin Hoffman's chart. Um, Dustin Hoffman, you know, everybody knows who, you know, the actor Dustin Hoffman. He's a very popular actor. He's got um, planets in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, in houses four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You can see them there. And that suggests an individual who is passive or subtle in their actions. It suggests that they permit others to take the lead. They tend to need others to motivate them before they take action. So they work really well in partnership or in group situations. They, according to Noel Till, the ego for somebody with a Western hemisphere um, is often projected onto others. They're the sort of person who gives and gives and gives even more of themselves. They often feel compelled to give themselves away to one degree or another. So that's how they feel good about themselves. He also has a quadrant emphasis to the southwest. Mm -hmm. um, right here, guys. Yeah, to the southwest, right there to the planets. If you look at, at planet or houses seven and eight in particular. Oh, uh, busyness right here. Lot yeah, a lot happening there. The moon, Neptune, Mercury, Sun, Pluto. Um, those, that's the Southwest quadrant. Um, and those individuals are typically relationship people. So actions in the life of the individual are, these are people who are open and exposed to others. And again, this would lead me to all sorts of questions about why do you feel the need to give yourself away? Um, what is it that you don't like about yourself that maybe that leads you to feel that way? Um, these are these individuals. Um, their activities are often very much a matter of public attention and record, and so it's not a surprise that an actor would have this uh, southwestern um, quadrant emphasis. Now the the chart pattern type from Mark Edmund Jones is what's called a splash. And that's another very common chart type. Um, the planets are fairly evenly distributed around the chart in a splash shape. So it's just like, just be here. Yeah. Everybody's pretty, pretty even, right? Yeah. It's some people think of it as a catch-all category, but it's not really. Um, 
we we don't use the splash the splash pattern just because we can't find a better pattern to fit the individual chart. Um, when I when I I misspoke a moment ago when I said it's fairly common. It's actually among the rarest of the chart patterns. Um, that's because there are typically only a few days in a typical year when the splash pattern is even possible. When the planet, when the planets are arranged in such a way that you can get a splash pattern. So, sure. Well, um, there's not a lot of conjunctions in a splash. Is that right? I think that's the correct pattern, right? Right. Now Whether we've got some conjunctions going on here in the eighth house. Um, but that's that's relatively uncommon for a splash pattern um, because they tend to be more spread out around the chart. Um, but but um, that's just a feature of Dustin Hoffman's chart that he has the the Mercury, Neptune, and the Moon all within seven degrees. Um, normally we would expect those to be spread out a little bit more, but it's still a splash pattern because the, pa the planets are all over the place. Again, here I am wheeling my mouse around when nobody can see it. Um, <laughs> that's just force of habit. I could talk yeah. with my hands. Um, uh, I do. I'll start talking with my hands, and I'm like, "Oh, I better get the mouse. They can't. This means nothing." <laughs> at their best, when you when we have an individual with a splash pattern, what we expect is um, an individual with a genuine universal interest they some other patterns give people more of a tendency to have a very focused focused almost like a laser beam kind of kind of set of interests splash individuals tend instead to have more general sets of of interest because the planets are so distributed about um so um no other pattern has broader general competency than the splash pattern. These people tend to be, um, can often be jacks of all trades. Um, uh, they can demonstrate a, a lot of different competencies. Yeah, and he's a pretty diverse human. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Not just in the acting, but even outside of that. That's right. Yeah. Um, so Jansky used to refer to them, said that they could be um, tempted to believe that they can be gifted or um, able to deal with any kind of situation that comes up. Sure. So you shouldn't expect the splash person to limit themselves to just one calling or profession. These are people who often in their lifetime have multiple life experiences, um, multiple jobs or professions. So um, he's got some very interesting aspect patterns in his chart. Right. One is a grand trine. It's what we call a dissociate grand trine. It's in fire with Mars, Saturn, and Pluto. Get my pencil. Yeah. Okay. So we've got Mars, Saturn, Pluto, where have you run off to? Here he is. Oh. Oh. So it's called dissociate because two of the planets are in fire signs, mm -hmm. but one is not. Um, so. Uh, the grand trine, like I said before, is an aspect pattern that forms when we have three trine aspects to each other. So the grand trine tends to be a very harmonious pattern. It represents perfect equilibrium and balance. And individuals with grand trines can have great talent ease, harmony. They can also tend to be, it also it ha, is associated with a static passive structure 
that doesn't promote growth. And that's because they find things so easy, so harmonious. Things come to them so easily that they're not well motivated to go out and make something of themselves. They're used to having everything come their way. Um, so um, the ancients used to think of the Grand Trine as being malefic because they can make an individual lazy. Um, they tend not to grow was the interpretation. And so because this is dissociative, does this, does this add to that? Because now you have like the one element that is not pure fire. Yeah, it tends to, not to add to it, it tends to weaken the Grand Tron. Or we, weaken it, yeah. That's a good way. Yeah, it tends to weaken the Grand Tron. Mm. Um, so the Grand Tron works against the formation of relationships. It, it tends to be an isolating structure. Um, so it can be more difficult for individuals with, with Grand Trons, and particularly multiple Grand Trons, to fulfill their needs. They need others to help in their need fulfillment. So um, Noel Till described the Grand Trine as a defensive structure. His exact words was that it was a closed circuit of protection of self-sufficiency. And he described all four types of major types of grand trines as the fire trine, the fire grand trine is a closed circuit of motivational and self-sufficiency. His way of describing it was, you can't tell me what anything I don't know. Mm. The earth grand trine is a closed circuit of practical self-sufficiency. I know how to do everything. I don't need your help. The air grand trine a closed circuit of social or intellectual self-sufficiency. I can get alone, I can get along alone quite nicely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> the water grand trine is a closed circuit of emotional self-sufficiency. I just don't want to get hurt. Um, again, if you don't mind. So what breaks the closed circuit of self-sufficiency in a grand trine, according to Noel Till, is a lot of oppositions and squares in the natal chart. Sure. Especially when they make an aspect to one of the planets in the grand trine. Because then it kind of so, makes you do something or like break it, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a way out of the grand trine. Um, it's a path out of the grand trine. So, this grand trine is mostly in fire, and fire grand trines are vital. They're self-expressive. They are spontaneous in action. They try to man. They 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 tend to manifest themselves in direct expression of their potential. So, um, when strongly emphasized, and when as we might say badly placed. Um, the individual can be egotistical, selfish, hmm. sometimes even have the assumption of special privilege. Um, so, the, but turn it around and the same individual can exhibit courage, adventurousness, risk-taking. They can even be prone to taking excessive gambles. So... Um, because they believe so deeply in themselves. One thing that you want to look out for if you have a fire grand trine in your chart is impulsiveness. And that's because they have a tendency to have this feeling of protection from harm and the ability to prevail against all odds. So again, that's where it helps give us some insight into ourselves. If we know that we have a fire grand trine, then we know what to look out for in our behavior. He has another grand trine. He has a grand trine in earth. Where's and that one has... Here we go. Okay. Yeah. We've got, the, we've, we've got in earth signs. 
So on one leg of this grand trine, we've got Mercury, Nep we've got Mercury, Moon, and Neptune up there. So we've got, oh yeah. So we've got the kind of the whole shebang. Yeah, we've got them. And then we have um, Jupiter and Uranus. And a Christmas star. Yes, Star of David. Um, very unusual pattern. Um, if it is a true Star of David, I'd have to look at it to see how exact those those um, grand trines work out. But it looks sort of like a Star of David right now, the way you've drawn it out. Yeah. Uh, um, this is my kindergarten art skills at its finest. So that, that's okay. Clearly, um, still helping me all these years later. Mm -hmm. The Grand Trine on Earth is the most typical of the Grand Trine patterns. And um, the individuals tend to want to preserve the status quo. We expect that with Earth signs, generally. Um, neither element nor the aspect itself, the, grand, the nature of the Grand Trine, the nature of the Earth planet, um, responds well to critical changes in life circumstances. They mm -hmm. tend to they, they they tend to prefer the status quo. Um, they're comfortable with things as the way they are. Um, I think of them as as having the sort of outlook that hobbits have in in the Lord of the Rings. Uh, they're they're comfortable in their lives. Um, so, um, had great houses, yes, so that's the, the hobbits did, yes, <laughs> with round little doors. Um, those that lived underground, um, um so, so we have a question really quick. Mm -hmm. So, we're gonna wrap up in about five minutes, you guys. But, Glenn, while we have you here, um, somebody is asking what's the significance of the Star of David in a pattern? That's a good question. Um, it's so rare. Um, I've only seen it in the Astro Data Bank. I think it only shows up once or twice. Wow. So, so nobody's given it a, a um, has studied the, the Star of David aspect pattern um, because it is mm -hmm. so, so, so rarely found out of all of the, I don't know how many, I think it's 80 some odd thousand individuals in the Astro Data Bank, 80 some odd thousand individuals. As I remember correctly, when I looked at it in Solar Fire, there were only one or two that showed up with a Star of David, Star of David wow. pattern. So that's a good question. Um, I just tend to focus on the two grand trines. Sure. Well, we've just created a research project for someone whoever would like to go in and see if there is a correlation between this particular star of David pattern in astrology and, you know, write a book for us. That would be really great. Thank you. <laughs> there are books written. There are enough people who have yods that there's a book written about <laughs> yods. Um, but I, uh, there, there's only a couple of individuals with star of David. It would be a, it would not even be a pamphlet. I don't think. Yeah. Well, a nice three page leaflet would be <laughs> sufficient yeah. enough to spark conversation, I think. Yeah, you could reach out to those two or three individuals and find out what they have in common. Right. Uh, other than the Star of David pattern. Um, I mean, that's how David Cochran does his research. Yeah. As he looks and sees what traits in common individuals with a particular harmonic pattern have. Um, so he pulls them out of the Astro data bank. And so if a given individual shows a, a strong 25th harmonic pattern, he will pull out all the individuals with a, with a strong 25th harmonic pattern and then start asking himself, what traits do these individuals have in common? He will Google the names, um, and try to get biographies on the individuals and then try to synthesize that information. That's how he goes about doing his research. 
Yeah, it's so fascinating. And we've had David, Linda, and Clarissa all uh -huh. over and to talk about it. And actually, Clarissa will be here next week as well. So okay. it's like, I feel like over on this channel, we're getting we're getting the vibe of vibrational astrology. We're gonna we're gonna have it by the end of the year. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah, you've been uh, doing lots of vibrational astrologers. Yes, it's uh, so fascinating. And it was not something that we had ever done over here. So it was like, I don't know, let's do it. So, you know, the next thing will be, I'll have to go find all the Vedic people. We haven't done that either. <laughs> There's a lot more of them than there are vibrational astrologers. <laughs> my, my class had 22 people in it. So, um, sure. I, mean, I think it was one of the larger classes. Sure. Uh, sure. There, the, in terms of people who have graduated from David's school, I believe it's been three classes. And he's yeah. not teaching it anymore in the future. So, um, our class was the last that he's teaching. So, mm. right now, there are. Um, in the United States anyways, I don't know, 65, 70 students um, who wow. do vibrational astrology. Yeah, so, I so. think 2021 will bring some, you know, um, raise in those numbers because certainly bringing vibrational astrology out over here was people were feeling like they could really connect to that. And they're like, I didn't know this mm -hmm. was an option. Right. You know? And that's kind of mm -hmm. neat. And David's now focusing a lot internationally. He gives a lot of lectures and dis and has discussions of, with with groups abroad. So he's he developed connections, strong connections in Serbia and Turkey and, and helping individuals establish schools there. He's got some students here who are teaching. Clarissa and the Barry um, yeah. are teaching here. So it's not that VA won't be continuing on without David teaching here in the United States. It's just that he's not, he's not doing it. Yeah, he's done it three times. And it's, it's one of those things that David has, he's, he's a polymath. He has a lot of talents. I know. And, and a lot of interests. And teaching um, in many ways robbed him of other opportunities. Because mm -hmm. he had to be there every Monday and Wednesday evening in order to teach us. And that's time that takes away from you. I mean, he's running a software business and he's doing vibrational astrology and he's talking and he's on the ISAR board. He's the research director for ISAR. Um, so he has so heavy many ongoing projects. Hmm? He's a heavy into his own mysticism as well. And that whole, yes. I mean, he's, he's starting there. He's mm -hmm. got a lot. He's very, I love all the Taurus in his chart, but I was like, when I saw his chart, I was like, I don't know anything about vibrational astrology, but this chart is so Uranian. I'm like, mm -hmm. you have a lot going on, David. So that's what a, what a treat though. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's a, but, he, he's a, as, as I told him on Saturday, when we graduated, um, he's a true match. Um, he's a very nice man. Yeah. He's a good guy. He genuinely cares about his students. He genuinely, he genuinely, he's passionate about vibrational astrology. And yeah. Yeah. It's a good deal. It's, I think we're pretty, pretty lucky to have him in, in this community. That's for sure. We are indeed. Yeah. Um, I've found that to be true though. Um, starting my, starting the, the magazine, Midheaven magazine, um, I reached out to about 45 astrologers to ask to write articles and to help me with editing and formatting and everything else, putting the journal together. And I had very few individuals turn me down. Um, even though I, you know, they're going to be paid through profit sharing. I, I don't have the, the deep pocket to be able to say, well, I can afford to pay you out of my pocket to begin with. So they're willing to take a chance. They're willing for the love of astrology in order to, um, be a part of that project. Um, and that's one of the wonderful things about the world of astrology is that there are so many um, idealistic individuals out there, so many individuals who are willing to um, help with making the astrological world better. So yeah. they're, they're, David's not alone. I can think of a number of, of really prominent astrologers who are um, very giving of themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And so when will Midheaven Magazine be out? 
The first edition will be out with the spring equinox. It will be published on each equinox and um, solstice. So manuscripts are due December the 1st. And I expect I'll get most of them pretty close to December the 1st. So that will make for a very busy three months as we're putting together the magazine. Um, I still have to reach out to advertisers. I still have to put together a website. Um, but we have two submissions that are um, in the final stages of revision. So I expect that we'll have positive, um, um, that we'll accept them for publication. Um, so that gives us a start. And just just before I wrap up with you, with Midheaven mm -hmm. Magazine, what is what is it about? What's the focus in it that maybe makes it different than something we've seen before? Yeah, something different than uh, than, for example, like the the mid um, the the mountain astrologer or um, the, the now defunct Dell horoscope. Um, what sets Midheaven Magazine apart is it focuses on the advanced professional astrologer. Mm -hmm. So it assumes that the reader knows the basics of astrology. So we don't, we, we, the, the, the writers do not have to feel compelled to describe how Mars works in a chart, for example, sure. or, or what a square is or what a conjunction is. They can assume that the reader has that basic foundational knowledge there. So it's, there is no, we don't do any any sun sign horoscopes or anything like that. So um, I'm I'm basing it on a magazine that was around in the early 1980s um, called the Mercury Hour, uh, which very much had a a professional focus to it. Um, yeah. So um, there is a professional magazine that comes out of. OPA, OPA, um, the Organization for Professional Astrologers, but its focus is on consulting skills. Sure. So this one here focuses more on techniques. There will be some, we have, we have columnists as well as feature writers, and the, at least one or two of our columnists will focus on, on consulting and professional practice issues. Um, but the rest focus on techniques and in some cases, some techniques that are not that yet widely known, but are becoming more widely known or were once widely known and if, have, are now coming back, like Uranian astrology. Sure. Uranian astrology used to be very popular and then it's waned and now it's coming back. VA is, on the, is, is something that's relatively new for most astrologers. So we have, a, we, we, we have uh, Linda Berry, for example, as a columnist with VA. Um, so, um, we have a number of people who do Western psychological astrology, uh, because that is the, the dominant form of, uh, school of astrology. We have a Vedic astrologer. Um, we, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of all of the diversity among the authors. Um, and the editorial team of Midheaven Magazine. We're a very diverse group um, in terms of gender, um, gender preference, race, ethnicity, internationalism, um, et cetera. So it's not like astrology in the 19, early 1980s, you know, although astrology in practice is, is predominantly um, women, not men, but yep. when you, but, but, but conferences tend to be heavily dominated. The, the people who speak tend to be heavily dominated by old white men. Um, and I definitely avoided that with the talent that I was cultivating for Midheaven Magazine. I wanted to have a diversity of voices. And we do, and people want to talk about all sorts You're of- You're one of those voices. <laughs> yes, I'm going to come and talk about social media and how do we take this thing and, and put it here and what does it mean and what's the impact? And I'm excited about that, but it is a beautiful, nice, big, full grouping of people that, that have some things to say about astrology and they're well thought out. They're useful and, and just nicely contemplated, I think. So I'm looking forward to, to seeing it come out in its fullest form and what it what it looks like on the other side. 
I am too. Uh, this, will, this will either be a, a grand success or a dismal failure. Um, <laughs> I'm on board for either, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. All right, you guys, we are going to wrap up today's Eat and Greet. And you can get Glenn's book at Amazon. I will make sure that there is a link in the description box down below, as well. I'll make sure that Glenn's um, website is down there if you want to reach out, contact, Great. questions, stuff like that, all that good they stuff. They can get it at Barnes and Nobles too. It's available for both uh, the Kindle and the Nook. Oh. So. And if you go out of your house, <laughs> go to Barnes and Nobles and you can see it there as well. So I'll just make sure that all of the links to connect are down yep. there. And when Midhaven Magazine is out, you guys, you'll also yep. see the launch and all of the good information about that around here as well. Wonderful. Cool. If people don't like Amazon or Barnes and Nobles, independent bookstores, stores, they can get it from Llewellyn okay. through independent bookstores. So that's who published it is Llewellyn Worldwide. So then it is definitely out there and available. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for coming over today, Glenn. This thank is a lot of fun. Me. Aspect patterns. I mean, there's just like a million. <laughs> there's so many, but hopefully you guys, you'll pick up the book and you'll, uh, you'll know what's happening there in your chart and in the chart of your friends and the world and everything else. So Glenn, thank you so much for coming over. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. All right, you wonderful. guys. We will see you on the next Eat and Greet, which will actually be on Friday. Jessica Lanyata will be here. We're going to go into some relationship astrology. And just remember, if you do want to see this video ad-free, you can join me over on Patreon for an ad-free Eat and Greet experience. So I look forward to seeing you guys on Friday. Bye, everybody.